You wouldn't happen to know where a tripod is, would you? It's so like a little. Um, so this may be 
our last in-person worship service together for a time, an ambiguous, unknown amount of time. But I'm inviting, or, or so, I'm inviting all of you who can and are interested in doing so to gather after this service. Ron McDougall will be joining us to answer questions on behalf of the conference, and we'll have a chance to do some of the brainstorming together about some of the um, issues that the council needs to make decisions about. We'll be getting your input, um, and uh, especially on how we best surround and take care of <coughs> one another and our most vulnerable members during this period of time. We have no intention of abandoning anyone. We want to be more present than ever, but we're going to have to be creative about that. So please um, join us if you can. Um, in spite of everything, this is still the third Sunday in Lent. Uh, we will continue in our Lenten practice. We will uh, worship, have online worship opportunities available. And this morning, we're still here. We're here with the fountain. Let's listen. We're here with this beautiful piece that Mary Bur uh, Burkett painted for us to anchor our reflections during Lent. We've got the beautiful flowers from uh, Sally Conklin, who wanted me to um, let you know that if you want to take some holy pussy with willows with you when you leave today, um, she invites you to do so. Is there anyone who has an announcement this morning? Aaron, okay. <clears throat> um, yes, we can explain creation care for Monday night, and we, re we will reschedule when, when we can. But I'm sorry. But can you tell a little bit more about like Sharon's situation? Um, the uh, tribal communities um, view their elders as a, a pretty valuable resource. They're very small communities, and um, they um, really oftentimes suffer from a variety of um, risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes. So they're particularly at risk um, for being out in the environment, um, in the environment we're in right now. So they um, send their, their, their story, they can't make it. They look forward to being here, though. So we will, we will reschedule in the future. Thank you, Karen. Any other? No. All right. Um, the one person who may want to be introduced, Dave, is it OK to, to welcome you this morning? Yeah, you can. Go ahead. OK. Dave Ottman is up in the balcony with a camera, a video camera. Um, and he has, you know, he and his family were members here for some time, and uh, he's returning to help us out with media during this time, and maybe he'll even want to stick around more. We'll see. But we're glad to have you. Now, oh, and you do have bulletins, or I mean, uh, slips of paper in your bulletins for the prayer concerns that you can pass in uh, during the transition music following the sermon. <clears throat> now, I invite us to go deep this morning. We are in one another's precious physical presence. We are in the presence of, of God, the living water that quenches our spiritual thirst. receive the blessing of this time together as we worship our God in the presence of one.
Please rise in body and in spirit. And join with me in our call to worship. Come, all who are thirsty. Come, all who are weak. Dip your hands in the stream. Refresh body and soul. Let us pray. Gracious God, you meet your people in watery places. You appear to Hagar at a well in the desert. You produce water from rock for the Israelites in the wilderness. You parted the sea. You worked transformation through the waters of the Jordan. You were present with Jesus and the Samaritan woman as they spoke beside a well. Lead us to the wellsprings in our lives. Teach us to tend our relationships with you, with each other, and with the rest of your good creation. In the name of the living water. Amen. Now turn in your teal song books to number 115. We'll sing together, Shall We Gather at the River?
There are two readings this morning. The first is from um, the book of John, chapter 4, verses 1 to 21 and 28 to 29. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given, given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husbands, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. For you have, oh, let's see, yeah. And what you, so what you have said is true that you don't have a husband. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain than in Jerusalem. And then the woman left the water, left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? The second reading is from uh, Jan Richardson. It's a poem called Blessing of the Well. If you stand at the edge of this blessing and call down into it, you will hear your words return to you. If you lean in and listen close, you will hear this blessing give the story of your life back to you. Quiet your voice. Quiet your judgment. Quiet the way you always tell your story to yourself. Quiet all these and you will hear the whole of it and the hollows of it, the spaces and the telling, the gaps where you hesitate to go. Sit at the rim of this blessing. Press your ear to its lip its sides, its curves that were carved out long ago by those whose thirst drove them deep. Those who dug into the layers with only their hands and hope. Rest yourself beside this blessing and you will begin to hear the sound of water entering the gaps. Still yourself and you will feel it rising within you, filling every hollow bringing forth a new Getting in place, let you might know that we're changing the, the song that we're singing this morning. The one that was scheduled for this morning needs a few more voices than we're able to assemble this morning. So we're singing this morning, uh, Blessings by the Lord Mixon Story.
just went out. Batteries. I think that blessings, that song of blessings, was just what I needed to hear and may have been what many of us needed to hear. Thank you. When it's a small group, we hear the individual voices better. Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. I had not ever noticed this before, but our story begins in an atmosphere of social distancing. Jesus, a Jew, is in a Samaritan village where, because of the ethnic and religious tensions between the two peoples, he should not be. He's alone in the center of a town full of people who have no reason to trust him and who are certainly not surrounding him with greetings. The unnamed woman who comes to the well is there at noon, not early in the morning or late in the afternoon when the rest of the village women gather to gossip and draw water for cooking and washing. For some reason, she is distancing herself from the people who should be her peers. This Jewish man and this Samaritan woman shouldn't be occupying the same space. They shouldn't be alone together. They shouldn't be drinking from the same well. They certainly shouldn't be talking with each other, and the man should not take water from the woman's hand. They shouldn't be meeting each other's eyes, or even bumping elbows. They're experiencing a kind of enforced social remoteness, something that we're about to become all too familiar with, except that their distance is marked by mistrust and social convention. Ours is a strange new way to offer care and solidarity. Theirs is about to be interrupted by the boundary-crossing actions of Jesus and the bold responses of the woman. Our distance will have to be circumvented in other ways. Not, alas, by drinking out of the same cup or dipper or whatever it is. It's been a strange week here in Lake Wobegon. <laughs> As events sparked by the spread of the novel coronavirus have swirled around us, whoopsie. As we've experienced with much of the nation, the enormous effort being taken to put brakes on almost all the ways we encounter each other in groups. Sports events canceled. Broadway shows shut down. Colleges sending students home, public schools closing. I can't help but wonder what it might be like if we were to respond to climate change in the same kind of crisis, shared crisis mode. Um, we might actually get somewhere. Diane and I have family members in Seattle, which Diane's daughter described to us the other day as ground zero for the coronavirus outbreak here in the United States. Her young daughter is, as of Friday, out of school for at least the next six weeks. And the emoticon that um, Erin sent with her text shows the, the, the face with the big eyes. <laughs> because Erin and her husband Andy are scrambling to figure out how they're going to tag team taking turns working at home and trying to imagine how they will keep their highly energetic, very demanding five-year-old occupied day in and day out at home without playmates for six weeks or more. 
Some of our parents and grandparents remember whole summers of keeping kids quarantined during polio outbreaks. May their memories and their spirits guide us now. When I first was thinking about this sermon a mere five days ago and dreamed up the title Thirsty for Encounter, I had a different sermon in mind. I was thinking about our yearning for the kind of deep engagement that Jesus and the Samaritan woman model in our story this morning. I was thinking about the ways each of us thirsts to be seen and known in true, life-giving ways. The way we long, like the Samaritan woman, to encounter one who knows all that we are and everything we've ever done and accepts us fully. And all that's there in the text. And all of that, I guess we'll wait for the next time this story comes around. Because instead, yesterday and this morning, I'm thinking about how thirsty we may soon be for a little simple face-to-face -face gossip. A hug and a laugh with a friend. Sharing a beer or a piece of pie at our favorite local pub. A chance meeting with a stranger at a well in the middle of a village square. Last week, we reflected on the story of Nicodemus, and we noticed the way that Jesus deliberately tugged him out of his place of knowing and a, where he had a sense of control and into a place of uncertainty and darkness. And now we're being tugged into a place of great uncertainty. All our systems, commercial, economic, educational, religious, are being thrown into a state of disequilibrium as we try to slow the spread of the new coronavirus and keep our medical systems from becoming overwhelmed. We don't have any clear idea when some kind of new normal may emerge. It's unnerving, and it's also an amazing opportunity. While few of us get through life without times of chaos and uncertainty, it's rare to experience such a vast decentering with other people throughout our city, our state, our nation, and much of the world. Norway, Denmark, Italy, China. Humans are at their best in a crisis. And the God of possibility is most fertile and creative in chaos and in darkness. Remember those first lines of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. <coughs> Some really great life forms emerged when God's Spirit had all that room to maneuver. An article in the Seattle Times tells about some of the ways people are finding to help each other during this time when so much is shut down. From online fundraisers for struggling local restaurants to a performance streaming site for artists whose live shows have been canceled, to a Facebook video created by an Ethiopian man so he could read public health information in the Amharic language for the Ethiopian community. Yes, the responses are heavy on technology, heavy on social media, but people are finding creative ways to help each other out. A more acoustic response took place in the town of Siena, northern Italy, when neighbors who were quarantined in their homes <clears throat> leaned out their windows and sang together to keep up their spirits. They lived on a narrow street, which made that easy. Mm -hmm. A little harder in our wider, with our wider lots. Folks in various places who don't have to self-quarantine are offering in-home childcare for strapped parents 
and delivering groceries to the families of kids who normally receive free breakfast and lunch at school. So here at First Congregational, we are going to be learning how to use social media a lot better to engage with you in worship and in pastoral care. And we're also going to use our phones and email to keep in touch with our members and friends. And many of you, even if you need to kind of sequester yourselves, many of you can get on the phone. Many of you can engage in online conversation, you know, email conversations with people and find out how they're doing and what they may need. We're going to pull together some volunteers who can deliver groceries and do chores. Dolan Cleary has already volunteered to be one of those people because he's trying to figure out how to spend his time <laughs> when he thought he was going to be in vacation in D.C. So thank you, Dolan, for uh, being ready to step forward. And Thursday's table board is figuring out how to best feed people during this time. Some of us, if we're healthy and at low risk, may be able to help with babysitting or drive folks to medical appointments. We'll build on the informal networks of care that we already have in place, but just maybe get them a little bit more coordinated um, and informed about what's going on. And we're going to start planning for some of these possibilities in our conversation after the church service. When Jesus and the Samaritan woman encounter each other at the well, their mutual vulnerability is striking. Jesus is thirsty and asking for help. The woman is alone at the well and, we learn as the story continues, has been widowed or divorced five times which means she's exceptionally vulnerable, exceptionally um, alone. The honest struggle and the spirited theological inquiry and conversation that emerges in this encounter happens as each of them begin to bear some of the soft underbelly of their need. A thirst. He for water, she for spiritual sustenance. Both, perhaps, for belonging. Together, they sip from God's living water. The woman, together, they become living water. And the woman leaves her water jug at the well and goes streaming forth to share that living water with her neighbors. Whether we worship here, together, or at home, or online during the coming weeks, we will all continue bathing in the living water of God's grace. We will still be able to go outside especially as it gets warmer, and feel the surge of spring emerging. We can walk by the river. We can touch the thawing ground, hang out among the trees and the birds and the squirrels, even when we have to keep three to six feet between us. We are really, truly all in this together. May our shared thirst draw us to the living water, and may we care for each other in our mutual need. Amen.
this time of prayer together with a moment of silence. Let us pray. Precious, loving God, our living water, our healing river, our well of blessing. We are here before you as your people. We are spacing out a distance between one another's physical bodies, but we are fully present to one another, and we are grateful to bask in your presence, to be wrapped in your love, to have your sustaining strength under our feet, your embrace around us, Thank you. Gracious God, in this time of international upset, we first of all pray for the many people whose lives are being upended by this. The people who are suffering economically, who are not going to have, um, be able to go to their jobs, or who are going to have to go to their jobs anyway, even if they are not well, who are trying to figure out how to care for children who are trying to make decisions about travel. The many, many, many um, challenges that are facing us individually and collectively. And God, we invite you to create in this moment, to create new ways for us to bless one another, to help us discover our resilience, to help us find out that there is so much more to how we can be together, how you can work, how we can engage with your creation. Be with us, O oh God, in this congregation, in this adventure. Be with the health workers who are on the front line of all this, who are trying to continue deliver, delivering regular care for regular people's needs and influenza care for people who have the flu, and now this. May they get enough rest. May they not be faced with um, decisions too painful to make. May they have care for their children. May they sustain one another and touch their patients in the loving, knowing way that is so poor to their beings. Gracious God, may our world leaders be sane and competent and careful and thoughtful and collaborative during this time. May our legislators, may our congressional representatives and our senators, may our city councils and our county boards and our public health departments find ways to work together. Help us to trust one another. Bless those who have been vulnerable to hate crimes because for the simple reason that they look like they might be of Asian descent. May the spirit of compassion overcome our tendency to panic, to react in fear. Gracious God, we offer before you the specific prayers of this congregation offered by your people. Here is a prayer 
that says, when change abounds, may we remember who we are at our core. Outside, we may feel lost, but inside, we are found. We offer prayers for the Menominee School Board as they continue to address issues of bullying and harassment but now especially as they tend to the needs of families and staff during this virus outbreak. The challenges that we had before are still there. They still need care, attention, reflection. Here's another prayer for the medical and caring staff taking care of people in hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, in their homes. May they stay safe and have the support they need to face each day. Prayers for all the people who are dealing with the coronavirus. We ask protection for the world and guidance for our decision makers. We also ask, great God, gracious God, your great love and care for Lynn, Lee and Cindy Theron and their daughter-in-law, Missy, as she undergoes surgery this morning for a brain tumor. Be with Missy's husband, Chris, and their two children. Continue to bless Tom Flug as he is in the ongoing process of the heal and repair of his broken ankle. Bless Mike Feigl as he continues to heal from heart surgery. David Cook as he grieves the loss of his beloved sister, Donna Jean. With Judy Muller and Jan Spielman as they undergo chemotherapy. With Karen Booman as she self-quarantines because of her immune susceptibility as a person who experienced a stem cell transplant a number of years ago. And gracious God, we thank you for Mary Burkett's return to us after so many weeks of sickness and for all the gifts she continued to give even when she was laid up, like the beautiful picture that graces the front of our sanctuary. Holy One, we join together now in the prayer that Jesus taught in gratitude to you for hearing and holding our deep knees, needs and prayers. And we will each address you as feels most comfortable and true. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come, and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And before we transition to the offering, I want to offer you a blessing um, in the form of a poem that was written last week by a UU minister named Lynn Ungar. And um, it's called Pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel. Cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it. 